Welcome to the On The Road Live RV Show this morning. I'm John Marucci, creator of the On The Road YouTube channel that provides RV specific videos to help enhance your travel experience. You know, the purpose of the On The Road Live Show is to provide a place to interact in community, get questions answered, and stay current on RV news, trends, and resources. Of course, anyone, no matter the experience level, is welcome to participate and ask questions and interact. It's good to have you on the show today and nice to connect with each of you live, so thank you for showing up. Feel free to put in the chat what location you're logging in from. Also, to ask a question, just put the word QUESTION in all caps in front of your comments so we can see it easily. On today's show, we're going to focus primarily on RV winterization. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. I see a few people already joined. Good morning, Michael. Nice to see you here. Uh, and uh, welcome again. Thank you uh, for joining up, and I think we're going to have a good, pretty good crowd and a pretty good discussion today on winterization. It's about that time of year to think about it, so hopefully we'll be uh, getting on it here quickly. So thanks again for joining. We're going to jump into our first segment here, which is the question, and the question segment of the show is about answering questions or looking at comments about specific relevant topics. You know, these are usually gleaned from viewers' follow-up questions, from various videos. As we go along, if the discussion spurns a question, just ask away in the chat. So here we go. Now again, this is on the topic of winterization. So Paul C. asks, Hi John, thank you for the great steps. Do you recommend adding antifreeze to your freshwater tank? I did not see it in your video or other related RPOD videos, but I've seen it in other winter RV winterization videos, so thanks in advance. So what Paul's getting at is one of the steps is to get all the water out of your freshwater tank when you winterize. And he's asking, should you put uh, RV antifreeze in the freshwater tank? And you know, I don't really see the need to use RV antifreeze in the freshwater tank. First, you know, there's a slight amount of water, if there is, that you leave in, even if you drain it off. There's just a little bit of water in there and it does freeze during the winter. It's not gonna have a real problem because there's plenty of room to expand. So it shouldn't really cause an issue. You know, second, I don't use the freshwater tank to add antifreeze into the system. I really bypass the freshwater tank and put antifreeze up through the water pump into the system. So I don't think there's very much need to put RV antifreeze in the freshwater tank and waste it unnecessarily. And also, you know, I don't want antifreeze, RV antifreeze in my freshwater tank next season when I go to dewinterize to try and drain that out. So there's a few things to answer Paul's question. A good question, though. The next question we get is from China 320. Excellent presentation, thanks. What I don't understand is if all the water was drained, talking about from the RV, why is there a need for antifreeze at all, right? So if you leave just a little water in the plumbing lines by accident, it can be a real problem and do damage to your lines if it freezes and expands. So unlike the fresh water tank, which has a lot of room to expand, your plumbing lines are pretty small. So if you get water in there and you can't get it out, it can freeze and cause a lot of problems when it expands. There's an ongoing debate, by the way, between those who only use forced air to blow out lines and those who use RV antifreeze. Now, I use the RV antifreeze method mainly because I'm more risk averse and I wanna make sure I don't have any water left in if I don't do the air compressor method properly. Neil Hudson has a great question here as well. So Neil asks, hi John, great video. I don't have access to an air compressor. Can I skip this step? Now the step Neil's talking about is when you blow uh, compressed air through the city water line uh, in the video that we're talking about shortly. Now, if you have used the city water connection when camping, in other words, if you hooked up to the campsite uh, plumbing and used water into the city water line, there's likely still water in that line that needs to be blown out with compressed air. And if you've not used city water inlet, then it's kind of your call on doing this step. I tend to err on the side of safety and blow this line out with air so no water can freeze the line and potentially damage or break the line. So again, I'm gonna to err to the side of safety. And then Kim Walker had a, a recent very good question here. I have a very important question. Antifreeze is very toxic to dogs. This is pouring out on the concrete. Is there antifreeze that is not poisonous to animals? Now she's referring to the step in the process where you open the low point drains and you run RV antifreeze through it and you know the antifreeze can uh, hit the ground there. But the point here is that the concern with safety to animals. Now remember, RV antifreeze is not automotive antifreeze. RV antifreeze is food safe and it's pink colored. Just remember that. It's pink colored RV antifreeze that can be purchased at a local Walmart or home improvement store in the RV section or from a local RV dealer. Just make sure you're only using the pink RV antifreeze and nothing else. 
So let's hop over to the chat for a minute, see if anyone has any questions following that. Just having a quick look. And I think just a quick good morning. I'm seeing some folks, uh, Dan, morning. Uh, I'm sorry, Dal, good morning from Golden, Colorado. Jeanette from Columbus, welcome. Mike, uh, Michael, uh, upstate New York. Diane Hoffman from Minnesota. And uh, Dave, good morning to you too. Thanks for joining everybody. We're going to hop into uh, RV News now. So the RV News section of the show is about getting up to speed on the latest RV news that may impact you. We look at various sources and just try to boil down the news uh, to the few main items. First, traditional forms of travel continue to be hit hard. And we talked about this in prior uh, live shows, and here's it again. The TSA checkpoint numbers are showing air travel is still recovering very slowly, as you can see in this chart. The past four weeks, uh, 2019's in blue and 2020's in the, in the gold color, saw 61 million uh, travelers versus 20 million this year, so a 32% rate. While the latest five weeks have maintained over 30% of prior year volumes, this level seems to be holding steady, meaning any quick recovery in air travel really seems less possible right now, unfortunately. Meanwhile, uh, new and used RVs for sale on RV Trader has increased since the early September as manufacturers begin to recover production and traditional camping season reaches its conclusion, as you can see from this chart. You'll notice here that the April number, there's a tremendous amount of, of RVs for sale, and then it went way down as demand picked up. As most of you are aware, there's been a huge demand for RVs given the, the latest situation in the country. Meanwhile, uh, Thor Industries, which is the largest manufacturer in North America, has seen its backlog of orders increase by 300% year over year, especially towable RVs. And this is a quote from Bob Martin, the head of, uh, head of Thor. Looking ahead, we expect a year of continued growth in fiscal 2021. As we concur with the RVIA's recent road signs, most likely forecast of an approximate 19.5% increase in calendar year 2021 shipments over their most likely estimate calendar 2020 shipments. So the important thing there is to notice that the very head of Thor Industries, which is the number one manufacturer, by the way, of RVs in North America, is saying they think they're going to have almost a 20% increase in sales next year. So they're ramping up production for sure. And this final chart here is overall RV sales continue to outpace same month for prior year. This is from RVIA, and you can see the numbers here pretty easily that you can see that the gold, uh, gold lines there are actually 2020 and the blue lines are 2019. So you see like April's really low because production pretty much shut down and then they ramped back up. <clears throat> and so uh, production has gone up and there's a continued anticipation that's gonna be the case going forward. So we're actually seeing RVs continue to grow and manufacturing continue to increase. Now, just a couple other points to cover. Uh, especially if you have anybody on the, on the line here from Canada, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico have extended travel restrictions for non-essential travel on their shared borders until October 21st. And really, that's probably going to be extended. So if you're planning on coming to the U.S., maybe Snowbird down here in the winter, you may want to think again. More than likely, this will be extended uh, with the current situation. So just be aware of that. If you're planning a trip up through Canada to Alaska, uh, you know, sometime, probably not in the winter. <laughs> but if you're planning on a trip from Canada to the U.S., just be aware of that. Okay, more news on the RPOD side. RPOD has just dropped the 191 twin model. If you're interested in a twin bed model, small travel trailer, unfortunately, RPOD is no longer an option. The RPOD 191 recently was dropped from the Forest River floor plans and shows as dealer stock only, meaning they're no longer producing this model, unfortunately. This is a sudden move as several dealers had these models on order very recently. This shows again the, more, uh, the move to larger travel trailers by RPOD. Currently, there are only three models still being made that were available when I purchased my 179 in the spring of 2017. Only the 171. The 179 and the 180 are still being built, and only two remaining with wet bass, which would be the 171 and the 179. Now, that's important because if you can deal with a wet bath, it means you have more floor space. And since 2019, they've actually dropped several models, including the 172, the 176, the 176T, the 178, and now the 191, the twin bed model. I actually really liked the twin bed model and was considering it, but that, obviously that's not going to be an option going forward. So these RV trader numbers that are coming up on the screen right now show what's for sale by quantity. You'll notice that most of the quantity is in the larger models, anything uh, north of the 193. You notice that there's eight 191s available, 
But if you actually go on there, you'll see these are all pictures waiting and orders about to come. So they're probably not available if you're looking for a twin bed model. There's also some really big changes with the latest model year for RPOD. With the release of the brand new models this summer and fall, most RPODs have seen significant changes, including a larger five point cubic foot two way refrigerator. Yet to accommodate the larger fridge, the convection microwaves have been moved to under the counter in smaller units. This means a loss of drawer space or storage space to accommodate the microwave's new location. So here's a look at the new 179 and the new exterior here. The 179, which is the trailer I have, this is the very latest model. You notice the glass door has been uh, included now. And this is the latest kind of the honeycomb look. Uh, notice that the font on the RPODs actually changed. I think that's going back to an earlier version of the RPOD with that uh, lower case. It's kind of nice looking actually. I like the outside of this. And then the other side of it, real quick, is the front here. And you'll notice that at the slide out area, you can see actually the vents on the refrigerator are much more spread apart. If you're a 179 owner like I am, you'll notice that is accommodating the new fridge. So very interesting there. So the big addition is that the Dometic 5.0 cubic foot refrigerator, which replaces the 3.7 uh, cubic foot fridge and changes the power, by the way, from being you know, three-way power and now only the two-way power. So all you have is shore power here and uh, gas. No longer do you have 12 volt power like on the smaller 3.7 cubic foot fridge. And the next slide here, look, notice the convection is that was on the top of the fridge is now residing in the corner storage area. This removes a bunch of storage for the 179. Now this is affectionately known by those of us who own this as the Bermuda Triangle. That space is huge back there under the stove. And uh, it's kind of hard to get in and out of there, but it does provide a significant amount of space that is now going to be taken up by the convection oven and basically a blank space under there. So important to understand that the convection has been moved and this removes a bunch of storage. And next, by doing that, they also had to change and move the vacuum unit to the bottom of the wardrobe, thus eliminating one of the three drawers. So there's a lot of changes, especially to the 179. And, you know, I bought the 179 primarily for the storage and the kitchen size. So this is a big change. So here's an audience question if you want to think about it with me for a moment. Uh, and feel free to queue up your answer if you want over the next minute or so here. Do the changes on the new smaller R pods like we just looked at, do these for these models, they make you more or less inclined to one of these models. So important question, with these changes and moving the microwave under the counter, et cetera, what does that mean to you? And we'll look at your responses in just a moment if you want to queue up your comments there. Uh, my take is used R pods are especially pricey just now as they're entry level trailers and demand is very high. Some believe this will ease up as we hit 2021. And while overall economic conditions will greatly impact future sales, airline traffic continues to struggle. And my take is that as long as this continues, demand for RVs will remain high to accommodate vacationing. In light of this, companies like Forest River should carefully evaluate a strategy of slowly eliminating smaller entry level trailers. Of course, this is a seller's market and is great news if you want to sell your RV just now, as prices are very high. It's not so good news if you're looking to buy one because you're going to have a hard time uh, getting a discount on anything. So let's take a moment at, and look at the chat for a second and see if there's any questions or any comments on that. Anybody all have a comment uh, on that as far as the changes to the R pods and what you think about it? Uh, Diane. Love my 2018 uh, 179 the way it is now. I'd have to agree with you, Diane. I like my uh, 2017 as well. I love having the, the storage. That's probably one of the main things I like about it because there's plenty of storage inside. You don't have to crawl to a, into a compartment outside to get stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, Terry, uh, of liking the location of the microwave, can't see I have can't see I and have to bend over to get the, the item. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying, Terry. Basically, now you have to bend over every time you're going to use the microwave. And that's I saw that the, the microwaves coming in like that on some of the newer units, the larger R pods. And that was the first thing I saw. I was like, man, I don't want to bend over every time I want to use it. So that's, that's a great point to make. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Steve, less interested. I don't want to give up my storage. Yep, me too. I think I'd have to vote in that, that side too. Probably less interested. Thanks, Steve, for weighing in. Okay, and just real quick, I see some other people joined. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Kevin, thanks for joining for, from Boston Lake, New York. 
Uh, it looks like uh, Bobby Johnson from West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining. Uh, looks like Wendy, you have one more thing. Let me put Wendy up there real quick here. I love my uh, 2019, uh, 2015 179 and the three-way fridge. You know, the three-way fridge, I actually use the battery part all the time, especially if I'm traveling with my 179 shorter distances. I won't use the propane part to keep the refrigerator cool. I'll just leave it on battery. Uh, my Toyota Tundra has a heavy-duty battery, and the seven-pin connector keeps it charged well, so I never have to worry about it. So getting rid of that battery part uh, power, that three-way power, is an important element for me as well. Okay, so let's move on here. We're going to go to Newbie Corner. Newbie Corner is a segment uh, all about covering a topic focused on helping those just getting started with RVing. Today, we're going to focus pretty much primarily on RV winterization. It's that time of year. If you have never winterized an RV, this section is for you, and we'll go over the main points to be aware of. By the way, this doesn't replace watching the step-by-step -step video on the channel. You know, we have a video that's been out there quite a little while that goes through the 179, and it really applies to many R-Pods as far as step-by-step -step how to go through the winterization process if you've never done it. You now, but this should serve as an overview to winterization. The main goal, by the way, of winterizing your trailer is to pre protect it over the colder, sub-freezing winter months. Generally, there are three parts in doing this. It's not that complicated. First of all, you want to get all the water out of every place in the trailer so nothing in your plumbing will break, right? No water. Next, you want to fill plumbing lines with RV antifreeze, or you're going to use a compressed air method and make sure there's absolutely zero water in your lines. And third, removing any items that should not be left in the trailer off-season. So let's look at each of these parts. So the first part is get water out, right? So there's several places you want to get the water out of the RV. First of all, your fresh water tank. And if you do go through the step-by-step -step process in the video, we'll talk about these in detail. Fresh water tank needs to be emptied. Your black and gray tanks need to be emptied thoroughly. And just a quick side note here, you want to make sure you're cognizant of this at your last camping trip to take a lot more time, if you can, to empty your black tank and gray tank at the dump station because that's going to be the last time you get to do that unless, like some of us uh, who I know, who can actually have a, a sewer system at their house they can dump into, but most people don't have that. For me, I have to go and make sure that I dump it very thoroughly and do a black tank flush and the whole thing at the dump station at my last camping trip. Now, remember that water expands when frozen, right? So it can break its containment if it's confined at all. You really don't want water sitting on your black and gray tank exhaust valves over the winter, so make sure you drain them thoroughly and take your time. I would even say if there's people lined up behind you, get, a, get another turn in line. It's that important to get those things empty thoroughly. Otherwise, make sure you do a good, good black tank flush, get everything out so that there's just nothing left in those tanks. Okay, the next piece is the low point drains. So the low point drains, these are the lowest point of plumbing lines on the trailer and should be used to remove the water and either be fully empty or have RV antifreeze in the lines. Now, all you do is uncap these, and then you, you open, open up a faucet, and the water is still coming out. The next thing is the water heater. Obviously, you have, this is a six-gallon water heater, the suburban water heater on most RVs, R-Pods especially, and they need to be fully drained and sprayed out. Now, let me take a moment here uh, that not just drain, you take the anode rod out, and that's the picture that you see on the screen of me using a 1 and 1 16th socket, and opening that and pulling the anode rod out, and then water will come out. Uh, you may want to release the pressure you see above that wrench, picture that wrench, there's a pressure release valve, it has a little blue circle around it, it's a pressure release valve. Release the pressure first, right, and then take the anode rod out, and water will gush out, there's six gallons in there, so it'll take a couple minutes. But then I get a hose, and you'll see this on the video, by the way, I get a hose and I spray out all the sediment, out of the tank, it's important to get that sediment out and just let it drain on its own for a while. Now, if you have just a, a, a small layer of water in there that you can't get out, that's fine. Remember, it has plenty of room to expand and usually isn't a problem off season. The next is the water lines. Obviously, these are your plumbing lines. You'll need to use an air compressor to clear the lines or replace the water in those lines with RV antifreeze to keep the lines and connections from breaking. These are the, probably the most important part. If you have water left in these small lines and connections, they will expand when they freeze and they'll start breaking those lines or breaking the connections. And finally, the faucets. You know, freezing water can cause real issue with faucets, showers inside and out, and your toilet all, obviously. And don't forget, those of you who have newer units that have the quick connect water line outside the trailer to get the water and water pressure out of those as well. Okay, uh, the second part 
of dewinterization is not just getting the water out, but getting antifreeze in. Now, the first thing you want to do, and this is again outlined fully in the in the video, is bypass the water heater. You got to do that because if you start bringing RV antifreeze into the system, the water pump's going to bring it right into the water heater and fill that up six gallons. That's why you bypass it. You don't want to put six gallons of antifreeze in a water heater when you don't need to. So you bypass the water heater valves, and then the antifreeze will go right into the system directly. And of course, you want to change the water pump intake valve to pull from the antifreeze bucket that you have or container and not from the fresh water tank. Again, we outlined this very clearly in the, in the video. And you're going to want to run RV antifreeze through the low point drain and all the lines and faucets. Basically, the pink antifreeze should show up everywhere. And here's a picture on the screen of it coming out the, uh, the kitchen sink there in my 179. So you're going to want to do this, run it through the water pump, run it into all the lines, and make sure you have antifreeze coming out everywhere. So just a quick side note, so why do I use the RV antifreeze method and not air compressor only? Many folks use an air compressor and simply empty all the water they can from the plumbing lines and then blow out the lines with an air compressor. Some have been doing this for years, by the way, in very cold climates without any issues. So I don't, I don't slap this down at all because I think it's a legitimate method. And although I've considered this method, I use antifreeze mainly because I'm not certain that the forced air method will actually remove all water. I feel more confident injecting RV antifreeze that I can visibly see in all the lines versus not knowing if I removed all the water. The risk is high if I get this wrong, by the way, a higher risk than I suppose I want to take. Also, it's important to note that if too much air pressure is used, if you don't know what you're doing, you can actually start blowing your plumbing lines and seals. So you got to be very careful if you just want to use compressed air. And then the third part is getting stuff out, right? So once you do that and you have all the water out of the unit, you have antifreeze in all your lines, it's looking good, you then want to get things out. First of all, things like your smoke detector battery. Now, uh, a, a safety point here to be aware of, make sure you leave the door to your smoke detector open off season. That'll remind you when you come back the next season that you, oh yeah, that's right, I gotta put the battery back in. Cause you don't wanna start camping and forget that you, you, you didn't replace your smoke detector battery. For safety first, make sure you leave that door open, but take the battery with you so it doesn't sit in the cold all winter. Remove any puck lights. I have a lot of puck lights in all my uh, storage areas. Remove those puck lights, take them inside and away from the trailer. And remove any items that you don't wanna stay in the trailer during storage. Ensure you make your trailer as unattractive to critters as possible, right? Now, we have an off-season RV interior prep video on the channel to help you out with this. It's got several steps to help out to talk through some of the issues you want to think about when you're storing your RV off-season. Okay, so that covers some of the main points to uh, winterization. And the next section is going to be a short section on the spotlight. The spotlight segment of the show is all about highlighting a specific resource so we become more informed. Now, before we look at our spotlight item, just a reminder that up next is our open Q&A. So feel free right now to queue up any questions in the comments. And remember to put question in front of your comments so we can easily see that you're actually asking a question uh, amongst the, all the chat. Now, our spotlight today is on the RV blowout plug from Amazon. I have, happen to have one right here. This is a blowout plug, right? It has a city water side and an air compressor side. And it's pretty simple to use. You just put that in your city water connection. You put your air compressor up to that and set it. And set it, uh, the air compressor, to the right PSI. I use 20 PSI, by the way. And blow out that uh, city water line. Now, this is an inexpensive blowout plug. And it screws right into your city water connection and, to your, and attaches to your air compressor. You can see that in the picture here. Uh, with this, you can potentially blow out all the water lines from your plumbing. But it's also essential to blow out the city water section of the plumbing lines when adding RV antifreeze. And that's one of the steps that we have. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the uh, spotlight section. And, you know, that's on the, that item's on the Amazon storefront at Amazon.com. Uh, slash shop slash John Marucci if you want one of those, if you need one of those. Okay, with that, it's time for open Q&A where you can ask pretty much any RV-related question you want. I know we talked a lot about winterization, so feel free to fire away on winterization or any other thing that comes to mind. And we will hop over to the uh, spotlight, uh, to the questions here, and let's see what we got. Hey, Paul. Nice to see you, Paul. 2016 RPOD 179. 
finishing up our fourth season and love it. And Paul, I don't know if you were on earlier, but I used one of your questions on winterization earlier. And thanks for being a long-term supporter and uh, of the channel. Paul, it's good to hear from you again. Finishing up your fourth season. Yeah, I just finished up, I think I just finished up my fourth season as well with my 179 and it's been really good too. So had some issues, but generally enjoyable to use. Thanks, Paul. Okay, let's see here. Wendy, if you use the blowout method, do you have to bypass the hot water tank? Uh, tank? Yeah, you usually still would because otherwise you're just going to be blowing a lot of compressed air into your hot water tank unnecessarily. So if you bypass that, you, you definitely don't have the same uh, issue with like filling up the, the hot water tank with compressed air. I don't think you need to do that. Now, one thing, just be aware, I'm not an expert on the compressed air thing. And you can go, uh, I know some people on the RPOD owners forum, for example, and I talked about this a little bit earlier. There's some people on the RPOD owners forum. This isn't the Facebook group. This is the old style uh, forum that has a bunch of folks who are, are really very knowledgeable in this stuff. There's a few people there have been doing this for years. I mentioned it earlier in the show. And one of the things you got to be aware of, don't ever uh, start your compressed air method without having something open, right? So make sure you have a faucet open or all your faucets open, but don't start that thing up with, with nothing open or you could really have a lot of problems. So be aware of that. But generally I would still bypass the hot water. Yep. To answer that question. Okay. Another question here. Let's see here. Jonathan question. Will the antifreeze cause any stains when left in the toilet or if it drips out anywhere? Should I worry about wiping up any excess? You know, we haven't, ha I haven't had that issue. I've used this for years. It doesn't have any staining problem. It's very easily diluted too. And it sits, you know, off season, it sits, you know, probably a quarter to half an inch of it on the seal of the toilet. And it's never been a problem at all. Uh, so no staining, no staining outside. You saw a picture earlier of it, you know, of my low point drains. I'll have a little bit of that run through and then cap that off while I'm winterizing and no problem on the cement under the RV. So no issues with staining at all that I've ever had. Okay, let's see here. Dave, we bought, we thought of moving to the 179 because of the storage in the large kitchen area. Without the storage, it's doubtful. That's, that's a good point, Dave. I mean, to me, the two biggest pluses of the 179 because, you know, you're giving up a dry bath for a small wet bath are the size of the unit and the storage. The kitchen, you know, if you guys don't know, I've worked remotely for my 179 many times, right? If not hundreds of nights, right, and days. Uh, working and living from my 179 uh, away from home. And the thing that I like so much about it is the large kitchen and the amount of indoor storage. Because if you're camping when it's cooler, for example, do you really want to hop outside to get into an external storage to get stuff? Or do you want to, you know, lift up your bed to get under the bed to get stuff or crawl under a bed to get stuff? And there are, the 179 has just been stellar, in my opinion. You have storage above the slide out. You have storage below the kitchen. You have a nice hanging wardrobe. You have three drawers under that. So I'm, you know, and mind you, it's to pick up uh, refrigerator space, right? That's the trade-off here. You're moving your convection oven down to pick up what it seems to be 1.3 cubic feet of refrigerator space. Now, what I'll do, and you guys may know this, I have, a, I have an Edge Star uh, portable freezer fridge that I bring with me, and I'd much rather have that and have the smaller fridge and have the, um, have the microwave above the fridge and have more space. So that's my take. It sounds like, Dave, you're kind of on the same page there. Uh, any other questions? I'll give it just a moment here. Winterization, if you're just getting started. Yep. Looks like Jeanette. Uh, do you leave the water heater and or rod in place or take it out for the winter? Okay, that's a really good question. Now, personally, I replace my anode rod when I dewinterize. So I usually just leave it in. Um, and the other reason I'm going to leave it in and not leave a hole, by the way, right? And if you take it out, guess what? You have a very small hole where that anode go, goes in the water heater. And you don't want to leave anything like that, right? Because if for me, I store my R-Pod off-premises at a professional storage area. And again, if you if you look at the other video about prepping your prepping your uh, RV or R-Pod for winter storage, it's really important to be mindful of, you know, any kind of gap, anything in your RV that can allow critters to come in because they'll be looking for warmth or bedding or whatever. And you, I don't want to have a hole like that, right? Because it's a small hole, but as you know, mice can get into very tiny places, right? So I'm going to keep that in. If it needs to be replaced, I'll replace it in the spring. I'll reinspect it in the spring. If it needs to be replaced, I'll replace it then with a new one. So I, I don't leave it out to answer your question. Long way around the barn, but to answer the question. Okay, 
let's see here. Yep, Steve, you have a good point there. The threads can rust too. Yeah, so, right, that's important. And I usually use Teflon tape on that, by the way. And uh, there's some commentary about that in some of the videos. But I leave it in there and leave it tightened and just don't mess with it. Hopefully that helps you net. Okay, any other questions? We want to give this some time. Anyone else questions on winterization, RV in general? It doesn't have to be about winterization. Make sure everyone has time to, to comment or ask questions on this. Give it a few seconds here. Don't want to belabor it. But if you have questions, just feel free to queue them up. Give it just a moment. Okay, we're going to then, we're probably just going to move on, though. If there's no more questions, we'll give it a second here. Uh, so that'll, that'll do it for today's show. Thanks for joining the live show, and thanks for watching the YouTube replay, those of you who are watching it on replay. You now, if you haven't already subscribed, we'd love to have you on the On the Road team. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at John Marucci, and now on Facebook at uh, John Marucci On the Road. So you can follow there uh, very easily and keep up the speed with what's going on. And uh, it looks like, wait a second, it looks like we may have a couple questions here just before I just jump off quickly. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, Shelly, how do you bypass the, pass the hot water tank? So, Shelly, I'm going to point you to the video we talked about earlier, which was the winterization video. For the 179, basically you have to take the plywood off of the, the bed, the back of the bed, and you'll find your water heater and water pump there. Now, next to the water heater, you have a red line, and I think it's a blue line. The red is the hot, the blue is the cold. And you'll see two little valves there. They'll be pointing in toward the water heater. On my unit, it's a little different depending on what model you have. You just have to turn those valves so that the water from the water pump will bypass that. It's not too difficult to see. Again, I point you on the YouTube channel. Just search for winterization on Google. Search for John Marucci, RPOD winterization, or RPOD winterization, and the video should pop up pretty easily for you. And it's just one of those steps. You'll see it very visually uh, about bypassing the hot water tank. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Wendy, what about cutting a hole in the plywood under the bed to access the tank? That's a great idea. <laughs> I've actually thought, why didn't they put a, an outside in a passage into the unit right there to get at, especially on the 179, taking the, taking the bedding off and taking the plywood off is just a pain, right? And then you have to unscrew the thing and, and do that. But some people actually have put like piano hinges on plywood so you can just open it up or like you said, a hole. If you do cut an actual hole to get in there, you got to, you know, you got to put your, it's got to be big enough, by the way, to put a, you know, a gallon of RV antifreeze down there. And then, you know, so not just a hole big enough to get your hand in there and turn the valves, but if you're going to do RV antifreeze, you got to get the tank, the, the gallon jug down there to feed the antifreeze in. So it's got to be more like a, maybe a lift or a piano hinge on a piece of plywood to do that. But some people actually have modded that way. Okay. I did that and put in a door. Now, Steve, that's that's outstanding. I thought, man, how do you, how would you do that? A door, and I think you're talking about either a door from the inside, probably. I mean, ideally, I wish they put a small utility door on the outside. Then it'd be really easy to deal with. But yeah, you can put a door in that and not have to deal with it too much. You can also get into it under the bed, but it's very difficult to do, and I don't think you can get a gallon jug in there. I'm talking about the 179 specific here and probably the 180 as well and a few other models. Okay. And I think that that's gonna uh, that's gonna be it for a while. Again, thanks everybody for joining. Appreciate the interaction. You know, again, this channel is all about helping you get the most out of your RV travel experience. And you know, if you haven't subscribed, remember to subscribe. We'd love to have you come along. Uh, and this is gonna call it for good. Now, hopefully, you guys have a great se rest of the season if you're still camping. Uh, and if it's time to winterize, make sure you use the uh, use the uh, things that we have to help you out. Uh, stay safe. This is John Marucci, and so long for now.